Good afternoon, everyone. It's so great to see all of you here for our lecture today. My name is Emma Raffi, Manager of Programs and Exhibition Production here at the museum. In Focus lectures are going to provide you with a behind the scenes look at what goes on here at the Eastman Museum. And our staff can provide uh, you with information and stories of the day to day work that we're doing. Um, and today our in focus topic is preservation and improving access to the Boyer collection. The Boyer collection includes over 10,000 objects and is one of the foundational collections within the museum holdings. And I'm happy to introduce Boyer cataloger and assistant collection manager Lillian Jones to present today's lecture. Good afternoon. Thank you, Emma. Um, if anyone has any questions, there'll be time at the end. I'm Lily Jones. I'm the assistant collection manager in the Department of Photography here at the museum. Uh, but before that, I was brought on as the cataloger for the Alden Scott Boyer Project. And this project, preserving and improving access to the Boyer Collection, has been made possible in part by a major grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, Democracy Demands Wisdom. Who was Alden Scott Boyer, and what was his involvement with the Easton Museum? Well, Boyer was a Chicago-based chemist who was the president of the Boyer Chemical Laboratory Company that produced various chemical products like perfume and cosmetics, but also household chemicals. Um, but he was also a collector. He collected a little bit of everything. He collected coins, bicycles, automobiles, perfume bottles, slot machines, and other coin-operated devices. Uh, he even had his own museum, the Boyer Museum of American Curiosities, which was located in a former bank building in Chicago. He like kept his things in a vault in that bank building. And he was known for this dogged pursuit of whatever it was he was interested in collecting at the time. And he would put ads in newspapers, listing what he was looking for. Uh, he had a whole network of correspondents he shared leads with. Um, he was basically like an American picker back in the 19. 30s and 40s. Um, and he was apparently very prompt with payment, which endeared him to sellers and helped him get the good stuff. And luckily for us um, at the Eastman, one of the areas he was interested in collecting was photography, particularly the origins and history of photography. And he became a great friend of Beaumont Newhall. He was the very first curator of photography and later the second ever director here at the Eastman. So in 1950, when Boyer decided he had collected enough, he was over collecting photographic material, he rang up Newhall and said, do you want to buy it or do you want me to give it to you? <laughs> I'm sure you can guess what the response was. <laughs> and that's how we got nearly five tons of material that is now dispersed throughout the museum, not just in the photography collection, but also in the library and the technology collection. And unfortunately, just three years later in 1953, Boyer would pass away, and his wife Elizabeth donated the remainder of the collection to the museum. So his donation was one of the foundational collections to this museum, and in the photography department alone, we have over 10,000 objects from Boyer. And through this grant from the NEH, we have so far been able to catalog and digitize nearly 8,500 of those objects. And in my position as the Boyer cataloger, I've done nearly 8,000 of those objects. <laughs> and these are all available for the public through our online collections on our website, eastman.org. Um, here's a screenshot of what, um, what that would look like if you were to go on the website and see it. Uh, this is a page from Maxim de Comte's Egypt, Nubi, Palestine, and Syria of the Temple of Dendur which if you've ever been to the Metropolitan Museum in New York City, that's the temple they have rebuilt in there. And just very briefly, if anyone is wondering what I mean when I say cataloging, uh, basically I take an object from the vault and I try to get as much information from it as I can. And this includes process ID. There's not just one way to make a photograph and determining the process ID can help me date the photograph as different photographic processes were popular at different times and were also invented at different times. Also, I'm transcribing anything written or printed on the object, I'm measuring it, I'm doing research if needed or if I have time, and then I'm putting all that information into our database so it can be accessible through to others. And you can see some of my tools here, pretty simple setup, just measuring tape, various magnification things, 
and my trusty nitrile gloves. We don't use cotton gloves here, it's nitrile all the way. So today, I'm going to highlight just a handful of the many objects in the Boyer collection. And starting with what is arguably the most important objects, the pencil of nature. And the pencil of nature by William Henry Fox Talbot is the first commercially published book illustrated with photographs made of negatives and it was issued from 1844 through 1846. Photography was officially invented in 1839, so this came out within five years of the official invention of photography. And of the approximately 40 surviving copies of the book, we actually have two copies from Boyer. One is complete with all 24 original image plates, and one is a little less complete. And the pencil of nature is illustrated with salted paper prints, which was a process invented by William Henry Fox Talbot, the book's maker. However, the salted paper prints are so early that they are not properly fixed. So while the image will not immediately disappear when exposed to light, like some examples of the process, they are still extremely light sensitive. Um, and so they are extremely sensitive to light induced deterioration. And you can see how faded this image of glassware is. So when we cataloged and digitized these objects, we had to do it in a red light environment, much like if you were working in a dark room. And we also did it with help from our lovely conservators. Thank you, Tina. And here's two more pages, um, one from each of our two pencil of nature's, pencils of nature, uh, with slightly stronger images. Uh, during the cataloging process in the red light, I realized that my measuring tape had red numbering, which does not work in a red light environment. So I ended up having to borrow a colleague's black numbered measuring tape. And these are two daguerreotypes by Southworth and Haas. And that was the Boston based partnership of Albert Sands Southworth and Josiah Johnson Haas. And they're considered one of the finest, if not the finest producers of early American daguerreotype portraits. And they photographed many of the elite of New England and beyond, like Ralph Waldo Emerson, former President Zachary Taylor, singer Jenny Lind, writer Harriet Beecher Stowe. And the portrait we see here on the left is of Dorothea Dix, who is a nurse known for her advocacy for the mentally ill. And the portrait on the right is of Augustus Gould, who was another well-known figure in the Boston medical community. And uh, Southworth and Haas was in business from 1843 until they dissolved the partnership in 1863. Alden Scott Boyer liked to collect what he called hoards. And these hoards would be whole photographer studios, family collections. He even collected other collectors' collections say that five times fast. Southworth and Haas would take multiple poses of their sitters, and the sitter would choose what they wanted, and Southworth and Haas kept the other plates. And after the forum dissolved, Haas continued his photography career, and many of those alternate plates remained in his possession. After his death in 1901, the family still had all of these plates, and while buyers were interested in the famous people, they were less interested in the unidentified portraits. So that's where Boyer comes in. And he purchased what was left, which included about 2,000 daguerreotype plates, along with business correspondence, original plate boxes, and even several of the original account books listing the sitters and the prices they paid for their portraits. So Southworth and Haas makes up a significant portion of the Boyer collection. And an advantage of being able to catalog a collection as a whole like this is being able to make connections across the collection. So as I'm going through, I see this already identified image of Augustus Gould, and I go, I've seen that guy before. So I was able to identify two other portraits of Gould. One just by himself on the left, he's looking a little older, maybe taken several years after the other one. And then this one where he is in a group, um, he's standing second from the left in the back there, um, unfortunately, I can only speculate who the rest of the sitters are. Maybe it's his family, his mother and his father and his siblings, but there's really no way to tell because there's no way to match a face 
to the name because there's no other pictures of them. But I was able to get Gould into the record. Uh, Boyer also collected smaller studios. Included in this collection is part of the studio of Edward Billings, who was a professional photographer in Racine, Wisconsin for nearly 50 years. And it's not a very significant holding like uh, Southworth and Haas is, but it does include glass negatives, stereo views, tin types, and even early advertisements. You can see on the left there is a broadside advertisement for Billings Sparrowtype Gallery, which is another word for tin type. So you can get an idea of what advertising and pricing was like at the time, like one framed bit, um, tin type is a dollar twenty-five. If you want eight Bonton pair of types, it's a dollar. Four of them, fifty cents. A deal. <clears throat> you can also see an example of one of Billings tin types. Um, I don't know what the backstory there is. Uh, it looks like a cutout that you would do maybe at a fair, but it's photograph. Um, I think this wasn't manipulated. I think it's actually a cutout and the person sticking his head over the cutout. But that's just some examples of what the everyday professional photographer at the time was doing. And Boyer wasn't just collecting the bodies of work of professional photographers. He also collected amateur photographers. Uh, the Boyer collection includes not quite 100 objects that are the work of Robert Shriver, that handsome gentleman far on the left. And Shriver was actually a banker at his day job, uh, but he was an ardent amateur photographer who was active from the 1860s all the way into the 1900s. He worked in the area of Cumberland, Maryland and Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, which is the location of the image right here on the far right. And again, it's just a great sample of what an amateur photographer was up to in the fairly early days of photography. In this case, along with sites of interest like the US Capitol, there's also a lot of railroad bridge images in this collection, as a lot of that was being built and rebuilt in that area during and after the Civil War. Um, in the image of Harper's Ferry, you can see the distant railroad crossing. Um, and some of Shriver's images show that aftermath of the Civil War in the area. So, as I said earlier, he also collected the collections of other collectors. Here we have some great theatrical carte de visites, uh, which are small card-mounted photographs about the size of a calling card, if anyone remembers those. Um, so you could give a portrait of yourself to a loved one, or if you could get portraits of celebrities or other public figures at the time to collect. You didn't have Instagram then to follow your celebrities, so carte de visites is where it was at. Some of the theatrical carte de visites in the Boyer collection come from Harold Seaton, who was a society columnist for the New York Herald Tribune and also Theater Magazine, and was known for collecting theater images. All three of these come from his collection. And I don't know if Boyer collected these directly from Seaton, but luckily Seaton wrote his name on the back along with help for information about the sitters and the photographs, which is how I was able to make that connection as I was going through and cataloging them. And there, these are some great examples of theatrical costuming from the 1860s and 70s. I included in the middle one of my favorite actresses that I learned from while doing this cataloging, Ada Isaacs Mencken, very interesting figure like short hair, she was actually one of the highest paid actresses of the time, and known for having an affair with Alexander Dumas, the writer of The Three Musketeers. But people at the time were not only collecting carte de visites, they were also collecting stereo views. Stereo views, also known as a stereograph, stereogram, stereo card, or just a stereo, are a double image that you can see here and that is because you would view them through a device called a stereoscope. And you're able to see the image in 3D. You can also do this like in person, like a magic eye. You hold it up and cross your eyes and pull it away. But 
I've never been able to get it. I just end up getting a headache. But if you're good at magic, magic eyes, you can try it out. And as I mentioned earlier, Boyer like to collect hordes. The Boyer collection has about 1,500 stereos in total. But of those, uh, nearly 500, so like a third of the collection, come from one family, the Smith and Van Shacks of Manlius, New York, near Syracuse. And this collection was shared between a brother and a sister and their spouses, who probably started collecting stereos when they were in their 20s and 30s, beginning in the 1860s. And stereos were popular from the 1850s all the way into the 1920s. They were like tourist items if you were on a vacation and wanted to bring something to remember them by. But you could also just order them if you're interested in location or a topic. Uh, they weren't just places, they were also stereos of floral arrangements, art, stereos have a little bit of everything. So it would be a fun activity for families to get together in the parlor and look at the stereos. So this gives us a very interesting look into what, I think they were an upper middle class family, but what families of that time were into. And they didn't have Twitter or Instagram, but they had stereo views. And here we have the distant lands of Egypt, also Halifax, Nova Scotia, the stockyards of Chicago, and Niagara Falls, um, back when it would freeze over and people would go and have fairs and other activities on the river itself below Niagara Falls. I love being able to make these connections across objects, um, whether they were all owned by the same family or the same person over multiple years, and I especially love when those connections lead me to learning some forgotten tidbit of history. Here we have four carte de visites um, that, as I was saying, I realized was connected. Uh, they were all in the same accession group. They had not been related in our database. And through research and the inscriptions on the back, I was able to determine that at one time, these were all members of Company G, the Ohio Volunteer Infantry, and the Union Army during the Civil War. And these are probably all collected in 1864 when they were stationed in Baton Rouge, Louisiana by one soldier, Samuel Ludwig. And unfortunately, he's not included in this. Um, I don't know if he's in the collection somewhere and not named or if he didn't have a picture of himself. It's certainly possible. And interestingly, this man on the far right, Marcus Spiegel, uh, who was a colonel, he was one of the highest ranking Jewish officers in the Civil War. And tragically, he died only a month after this was taken in May of 1864 in, during the Red River Campaign. But this is all information as I'm going through and cataloging that I'm able to link to these objects and put in the database for others to use. And this is another example of making connections across the collection. And the object on the far left is an album of tin types taken by an amateur photographer, Dana Downs, from Long Island. And they were mostly taken in the 1890s. As I was cataloging this, I came across the page in the middle of the album that you see in the middle there with a missing tin type. And I realized I had seen those people in those outfits holding that flag before. So I was able to go back in the tin types I had already cataloged and find this one and reunite it with the book it came out of and reunite that information. The date's in there, um, so you didn't have to guess anymore. You can see more of the makers in there, Dana Dowens. So things like this show what a great advantage it is to be able to catalog this collection as a whole in one big batch. And also the album itself is just another great example of how people were just taking pictures of their friends, doing stuff, going to fairs, like we still do today. Another great part of cataloging is being able to add to our existing collections without actually adding anything. An important aspect to the research side of cataloging is being able to attribute photographers to objects. And these are both photographs from 1860 from the Siege of Palermo, Sicily by Giuseppe Garibaldi during the Italian Unification Wars. And I believe one already had a name attached to it that I was able to use as a jumping off point. And thanks to our great library that had a catalog in Italian, 
I was able to attribute the rest of the images to a photographer named Luigi Sacchi, who was an early Italian photographer, and he operated only for a very short time. Uh, he died in 1861. So before, we only had one image by him in the collection, and now we have five. It's also fun to get an idea of what Boyer himself was interested in. He really liked inventors and scientists in general, which makes sense since he was a chemist himself. The portrait on the right, um, no, portrait on the far left is um, a salted paper print by Hilden Adamson, who are an early um, Scottish photographer duo known for their portraits. Uh, this is a photo of James Naismith, who invented the steam hammer. Uh, this was apparently Boyer's favorite of all the Hill and Adamsons he collected. Um, Hill and Adamson is another very solid portion of the Boyer collection with a little over 200 objects, and they were working in the 1840s in Scotland. And there's also a carte de visite of Louis Agassiz, a biologist and geologist, and a carte de visite of Samuel Morse, inventor of the telegraph. Boyer was also into early aviation. The stereo on the far left is of Professor Thaddeus S. C. Lowe, not a real professor. Uh, and it was taken likely during his demonstration of his hot air balloon uh, when he flew it from Philadelphia to New Jersey in 1860. He is a very interesting character. He actually later during the Civil War became the chief aeronaut of the Union Army Balloon Corps and he did reconnaissance for the, um, for the Union Army using his balloon. And one story goes, he crashed over enemy lines and injured his ankle and was unable to make it back to Union territory. So his wife, dressed up as a hag, crossed enemy lines and rescued him and brought him back. And like, why, where else would I have found that out information if I didn't have to catalog that stereograph? Uh, we also have an image of the pilot Pierre Chanteloup, who was a French aviator. And this was probably an air demonstration or maybe even an air race, probably taken within the first decade of flight. We also have the USS Shenandoah, which made the first airship crossing of North America in the 1920s. It's also an example of how Boyer collected. We have a large group of these US Army Air Corps aerial views that had a note from Boyer saying they were discovered in a junkyard. And now they're here. And as I mentioned way in the beginning, Boyer collected bicycles. So no surprise, we find images of early bicycle clubs. The image on the left is the Boston Bicycle Club, which was the first bicycle club in America and which was founded in 1878, just the year before this image was taken. And this very amber is the color of its energy image on the right is of the Montreal Bicycle Club. It even lists at the top all of the officers of the club and has some examples of fantastic early bikes. I don't know how well you can see it, but to the like left in the picture, there's a double seater so you can ride around with your friend. Love that bike. And that's part of what makes this such a cool collection to work with is the breadth of the object. You have historically important images like these, the one on the left from Alexander Gardner's sketchbook of the Civil War. It's of Abraham Lincoln at the Antietam battlefields. You can see Lincoln is the tall guy in the middle. And the image on the right is of Aaron Molyneux Hewlett, who was the first black instructor at Harvard University where he taught physical education. He was also an entrepreneur and activist. And that image comes out of a Harvard University yearbook from 1863. The Boyer Collection has these works by important photographers, but it also has works by small town professional photographers and works by regular people who like to take pictures. Um, vernacular photography, portrait photography, aerial photography, there's a lot. And it spans from the beginning of photography all the way up to the 1940s. You also have some interesting curiosities from the time. These are just some objects I think are neat. Um, the stereo on the upper left is a cat that has been the old-timey version of photoshopped into the ruins of the post office after the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. Why? Is it a meme? Are we implicating the cat in the fire? I don't know. I just think it's kind of fun. 
You also have a carte de visite of someone in an oyster costume. I'm assuming they're trying to sell oysters. I don't know the backstory on that either. But I really, they have seaweed hair. Their suit is entirely printed with oyster print. And this also is interesting from both a history of photography stance and just interesting to look at. It's an uncut carte de visite sheet. So you can see both kind of examples of how those would have been shot and how it would have been made before you cut them and pasted them into the little cards like the oyster man. And you can also see this guy trying out all his different poses, trying sitting backwards in a chair even, looking kind of kind of cool and laid back. <clears throat> and this is truly an incredible collection. And I really enjoyed going through it and being able to make these objects and the information they contain accessible. So if you're interested in any of this, head to eastman.org and check out our online collections. Thank you so much for coming and thank you to the National Endowment for the Humanities for this grant that allowed us to catalog and digitize all that Alden Scott Boyer has given to the photography collection. And thank you for, to my colleagues for the help along the way. We're 90% there. So if anyone has any questions or wants to see any other images more or know anything else, feel free to ask.